Welcome to the Expansionist Podcast with Shelley Shepard and Heather Drake. At each episode, we dive deep into conversations that challenge conventional thinking, amplify diverse voices, and foster a community grounded in wisdom, spirit, and love. Welcome, Liz Coolidge Jenkins. Welcome, Ooh. Heather Drake. Good to see you both here today in studio. Thank nice you. Nice to being be here, here. Shelley. Liz, so nice to have you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me here. You're our first guest, so consider yourself super, yes. super uh, important. Yeah. <laughs> I feel honored. Yeah. <laughs> Very honored. The first, the first. Um, so, so thank you, Liz, um, for for making time to come as uh, today, just to share with us from your your recently authored book, uh, 2000, December 2023, of nice churchy patriarchy. Wow, that just has like this beautiful ring that I could not resist when I when I saw you on Instagram. I'm like, okay, this is a person that we definitely <laughs> want to be talking to because wow, there is so much patriarchy around us. Uh, somebody needs to be peeling that layer back like in a constant stream, in a constant format. Constantly. And so yeah. hopefully today, um, as we embark on this uh, exchange with you, we will begin to learn from your perspective what that has been like, what it feels like, what it sounds like uh, to you and to those that listen. Uh, prayerfully, they will be encouraged to uh, to understand where where we're all coming from. So welcome to, to this uh, Expansionist podcast today. Thanks so much. So Heather, I know you're you're probably just like busting at the seams to ask this first question uh, to get us rolling. Uh, is there one at the top of your mind? Well, I, I yeah, I have lots. I have lots of questions, and I am. I, I just want to reiterate something that you had said. Like it was such a beautiful um, an invitation, I think, by spirit that led us to like listen and go. Oh, we hear mm. a similar sound in what you are offering. And, yes. you know, we were, you know, instantly attracted to a few of the posts, but then as the further on we get, we're like, this is exactly what we are saying and how we're saying it. One of the things that's important mm. to Shelly and I is the, um, the, certainly the message and the invitation of the spirit, the divine feminine to expand the way that we're thinking, the way that we're seeing, the way that we're even experiencing church or spiritual growth, spiritual formation, and where we've seen things that are not only dismissive and constricting, but also oppressive to people. We want to say, you know, this is the hope of spirit to tor tear like the hinges off the doors and say, everybody gets mm. to come in and everybody gets to come to the table. But in a way that is still honoring and loving, we love the church and saying that there's a better way, there's a bigger way, there's a more expansive way is hopeful in its essence. And that's something that we felt like we connected a lot with the message that you offer as well. So tell us a little bit about um, mm -hmm. how you feel like you have the right to expand theology? <laughs> yes. Great yeah. question. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Um, and I really like the phrasing of expansion or expanding because I think, you know, um, sometimes there are things that aren't working that we need to leave behind or rethink. And sometimes there are things that are not necessarily bad, but they're not the whole picture. And so that idea of expanding is kind of like, what are, what are, what do we want to add? Like, what have we been missing? What voices have we not been hearing from? And it doesn't mean that the voices we have been hearing from aren't valid. It just means that they're not everything. Um, so that's been a lot of my journey and kind of what I think about when I think about expanding our theology or our view of God. Um, yeah. What, what have we been missing? What more is there? And I think there's a lot more. I see that question. Yeah. I was, ahead, so um, sometimes Shelly and I talk over each other because we get very excited about things. So I want to be really purposeful not to do that. <laughs> but um, so when we're talking about expanding theology, and I want to ask you a question, um, this is not just a new set of beliefs, is it? I mean, because I think that there's more. I think it is an invitation into how we actually live and how we can embody practices that um, actually fuel a, a relationship with the divine and our connectedness to everything. And so can you talk for a second about what mm. changing your perspective and maybe even coming out from um, 
like the blinders that patriarchy gave us into a, a like our eyes wide open going, wow, there's a lot of gifts that are already around us and how do we make use of those? So I don't know if any of that sparked any kind of thing for you to talk about, but I would love to hear what you're learning about that or what you've already learned. Yeah, I feel like there's a few different directions that could go in. Um, I think one of them is that, um, like you said, our faith is not just this intellectual, rational thing or a set of beliefs. It's it's that, and it's also how we live and how we engage and um, yeah, what practices we want to embody. Um, and I think when we think of of God and gender and theology, oftentimes masculinity has been constructed in terms of rationality and intellect and femininity has been constructed in terms of feelings and intuition. Um, And when we value one of those sides over the other, we get this very lopsided kind of faith or kind of spirituality. So I think that's part of what's been going on that we have to even say that like, it's not just about belief, it's about who we are and how we live in this much more holistic thing. Um, so I think there's that. And, and then you also kind of talk about about the blinders that we have and how we work on seeing beyond those blinders or getting rid of those blinders. Um, uh, I, I think that's huge. I think um, in the book, I reflect a bit on my time in seminary. Um, this was that kind of a a somewhat conservative evangelical seminary. Um, <laughs> uh, that's go ahead, Liz. <laughs> Put them out there. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking about this. <laughs> that's um, I think in a lot of ways wanting to be uh, inclusive or affirming of of women, of people of color, and yet it's rooted mm-hmm. in this very white male dominated history yeah. and white male dominated tradition and. Um, so by the time I got there, which was, you know, 2016 to 2019, um, there was a lot of a lot of talk of supporting and affirming women in ministry. And yet you go to these classes and you're assigned readings and almost all of them are written by men still. Um, you know, even with well-intentioned professors who don't mean to perpetuate this very male-dominated faith, and yet we're assigned all these readings, and it's it's very clear who they're written by and who they're not written by, and who is considered an expert in things and who is not. Um, so I think that naturally creates a set of blinders when you're only reading the perspectives of white mm-hmm. men, um, not because they don't have good things to offer, but because it's not the whole picture. Um so, yeah, I think there's been a lot of work to do in in seeking out different voices, seeking out women's voices, voices of color, especially voices of women of color, um, and trying to figure out like, yeah, like what <laughs> what what do we what do we add? And it is really different, right? There's there's so much that all those voices have to add and um, yeah. Sometimes I wonder <clears throat> Liz if if all these years of patriarchy have uh, caused us not to be able to hear her voice. Hmm. Like sometimes I wonder that, right? Um, it, yeah, it's it, it's a wonderment all the time. Like, how do we how do we make re- room for for the feminine spirit of God to um, to get to us to to penetrate, um, <laughs> you know, our clogged ears or whatever whatever that looks like because we have been. Um, so entertained by male patriarchy for so many years. There's a there's a place in your book where you talk about this experience that you had on a Wednesday morning, where you began to um, hear the feminine pronouns uh, to the Holy Spirit, and and I'm quoting you here. You said it was a visceral gut level revelation. Can you talk to us about that experience that you had with spirit that day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I I reflect a bit on the book on um, a time in seminary chapel. There was like a weekly chapel service um, and a, a worship team that kind of led us in songs during that time. And I was just kind of totally... I'm trying not to say shocked because I feel like that sounds like it has a negative connotation. 
Um, but totally just like surprised and, uh, it was just a really unexpectedly powerful experience to hear them sing her eye is on the sparrow. Um, mm. and so one of the chapel musicians had actually, uh, pretty extensively rewritten the lyrics to his eye is on the sparrow, um, which I didn't quite realize fully at the time because I wasn't super familiar with those lyrics. Um, but the singer's name is Megan Moody and they had really, yeah, I've really thought this through in terms of what does the feminine eye of God being on the sparrow look and feel like? Um, mm. And they sang that over us and with us. And that was wow. so, yeah, so powerful. Um, Cause I think like, I kind of knew that, you know, God is not male or female in the way that humans are, right? God created both men and women in God's own image. Um, I kind of knew that that God is not a man, right? Um, yes. And yet all of the songs that we usually sing in church have these masculine pronouns. All of the prayers we pray are to God the Father. Um, and all of the ways that we talk about God are very masculine, And so I think to hear it in this very different way um, just really, really hit me on a deep level of like, oh, yeah, like this is Mm. this is real. Like God is is feminine as much as God is masculine. And I, as a woman, Mm -hmm. am made in the image of God as much as any man is made in the image of God. Um, And I think I could have said, like, I believe those things. But something about hearing that song and seeing it embodied in the singers in that way um, was really striking. Thank you for that. And Heather, you and I talk about this sometimes. Once you've experienced uh, or tasted that portion of the feminine, it's hard, you know, to go back. (laughs) Maybe is the right word. It's hard to not have it. I would almost say impossible. It would be impossible because it it is like tasting something more. Um, and, or breathing something more, especially not just for women, but I think mm-hmm. when we're talking about the sacred divine or the divine feminine, it is what we're attributing to is the nurture, is the kindness, the tenderness, the compassion, the all of the things that love is. And, and so to be able to say that that's how we're experiencing God, I believe that that was always supposed to be how we experienced God, not in a yeah. way that was judgmental, wrathful, a lot like Zeus. You know, it was Jesus coming and saying, God is like a woman who looks for a coin and does not stop until the coin is found. And so this understanding that ever since Jesus was here telling us, what God is like, who God is like, how God acts. God is like the shepherd, but God is like a woman who searches. And that was um, a a part of the picture or the image of God that seemed to have been maybe not avoided, but certainly not um, uh, told a lot in Sunday school. Like God is a woman who will come for you. And and I love that. And Shelly, you and I have talked about this, that idea that God is like a woman who looks for a coin. The coin has no fault in being lost. The coin does it. That's not the. And so to me, that's such a beautiful part about God, wherever we find ourselves in our pain, in our isolation, in our even oppression, not to our fault, but God will still come and look for us. And the beauty of the God that comes to us is this nurturing God, is this loving God, is this God who is full of compassion, the spirit of God who intends to birth, I believe, I'm so excited about these kind of talks because I see chaos around us. And I'm just reminded of that first Genesis story where it says the spirit of God hovered over, brooded over the chaos. And I'm like, oh, look, we've given you another place to to build something completely beautiful. Here's a place for you to create spirit of God. Beautiful. Liz, I want to go to uh, another place in in the beginning of this section uh, of your book, expanding, uh, expanding theology. And and you talk about um, we've developed uh, spiritually in dangerous and violent ways because of this uh, presence of, of patriarchy. And your words, quoting you, we have been poisoned by it, really. And when I read that, I was like, okay, where is the Center for Disease Control? <laughs> how, yeah. do we, how do we fix this? How do we, how do we find a way to not isolate male from female, right? Mm. Um, this isn't this isn't a uh, campaign on uh, 
just elevating um, the, the feminine spirit of God only. But there has definitely been this out of balanceness with us being able to hear her in liturgy, in worship, in prayers, in, in the whole nine yards. And so that particular uh, piece in your book uh, spoke to me very strongly. And then like, what's the remedy? What's the, uh, the, um, the antidote for, for this uh, space that we're facing? And then speak a little bit about, were you in seminary, still in seminary when you wrote the thought or had the thought, I can't listen to, I can't read one more male author or listen to one more male pastor, or I am just going to go jump off a cliff in Oregon somewhere. Uh, Talk to us a little (laughs) bit about that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, there's a lot there. Um, and I like Sorry the about that. I know. Poison, no, no, it's okay. good. Poison and, and male authors and male preachers. I condensed it for you. There you go. Yeah. I like what you say about balancing, though. I feel like that's a good word for it, that it's been so out of balance. Um, and I, I also wanted to say that, yeah, I think the the poison metaphor feels very fitting mm. um, to me because it's it's kind of like Heather, what you were saying about the coin not being its fault that it's lost. Like we have been poisoned by living in this world and this society, and often spending a ton of time in churches where things are so lopsided and so off balance. Um, and it's not necessarily our fault that that happened, and yet when you get poisoned, like you figure out what to do about it, right? Like you take action to heal and make yourself well. And that's like very urgent and very important. So that's, yeah, that's just to draw that that metaphor out a little bit. Um, Mm. But yeah, um, I think when I, so when you're in seminary, you don't have a ton of control. I didn't feel like I had a ton of control over what I was reading, right? You're assigned all these readings and it's kind of hard to find spare time and energy to do a lot on your own beyond that. Um, and so I think I think I kind of felt the lopsidedness in seminary, but wasn't really sure what to do about it. Um, so kind of went with it and um, I learned toward the very end of my seminary education that I had at least one classmate who actually made a point to go to a professor at the beginning of the quarter. And if the reading list was very male dominated or very white dominated or both to be like, Hey, mm. this is what I notice. <laughs> like, are there some other readings that you could assign me? Like, I don't want this to be how I'm formed, right? And I was like, oh, wow. I didn't know you could do that. So put that out there to anybody who might be in that situation. Yes. That, um, some professors might be open to that and might take mm. notice if a lot of students are asking for things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it was kind of when I graduated that I looked back on the experience as a whole. Um, and I decided to put uh, kind of full-time intentional effort into writing. Um, and I feel like reading is very much part of that work of writing, right? It's very much required for mm. it. Um, so I had a ton of time um, and, and energy now, right, to go back and, and think, what did I miss? And to, mm-hmm. to be really intentional about who I was uh, reading and what kind of authors I was seeking out. So I think it was at that point, I don't know if it was so much of a like, can't read one more male book, but kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Definitely yes. an effort to skew towards women. And then as time went on to skew towards women of color as well. Yeah. Something happened and I don't know how it came about in whatever the spirit was leading for, um, for Dennis and I what is about five years ago. We noticed that a very similar thing we are only like all of the books in our um, in our like repertoire that we would quote to people or we would um, do that is typically white people. We um, and then most of it men, not all of it, because we are early adapters to Lori Beth Jones and the wisdom that she offers and some of the other women. But so we just decided for ourselves, like, what if we for the next two years spent all of the time just reading women of color? And we came across Mm -hmm. bell hooks and my husband was horrified when he said, I am over the age of 50 and this is the first time I am reading her. 
Like, why isn't this something Mm -hmm. that was gifted to me upon becoming like, you know, a man old enough to be able to, you know, if you can have a family and you're in a job in leadership, you should be reading bell hooks, you know? And so, and not just bell hooks. I mean, we just found so many beautiful authors who offered uh, of a, a particular sound who offered an experience, mm-hmm. who offered uh, um, s- a way of embodying the love of Christ that is so different than what we had heard over and over and over again. And so it really expanded our ability to even find other authors because then, you know, who else is out there that we are trying to discover and what we're hearing and how that changes us. And so one of the things that I loved right away about you was like, oh, we both love bell hooks. And when we both look at this and yeah. go, and, and, and bell hooks, I would say, is not necessarily an easy read for this reason. If you really listen to her, you will have to make some changes or ignore the text all completely. And I don't think we can do that. And so um, difficult to read, but, but, but so hopeful in the living out of, of things. And so, and again, she doesn't have just one book. There's a beautiful library of all kinds of things we can get in. But we've, on a regular basis, purchased Bell Hooks books for people, particularly men. And we're like, this book is going to help you and your life and your family and how she follows God, but also the honoring of the masculine. It's not to tear anything down, but to listen to the feminine go, if you don't listen to the whole story, you're missing out on all the good bits. You're missing out on the life that God has intended for us to co-create together. So kudos on finding, do you have a favorite um, Bell Hooks book? Um, I don't think that I could pick one, although I would say that the will to change is very powerful. Yeah. Um, And yeah, I think what's powerful. Yeah. That's a, that's a good entry, entry book there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's so powerful. Like you said, how her vision is one of shared power and mutual flourishing, not of women dominating men. Um, Yeah. It's flourishing for everybody. And she really gets into the ways that patriarchy harms women and also harms men and harms our whole society. We want to pause and take a moment and let you know how glad we are that you've joined us. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider sharing it with a friend. And if you found the conversation intriguing and want to know more about what we're learning or how you can join our online community, visit our website at expansionisttheology.com. The introduction, not that this is a new introduction, but the womanist, the womanist theology that uh, we're hearing more and more about. Um, but there were some, some very strong African-American women and people of color that, that established, that took a stand um, in, in, in a time that it was very, very difficult to put their theology up front and, and to say, we're going to look through this lens, through my lens, uh, first as a woman and then as a, a woman of color, and we're going to look at every single word of this text until you can see it from a different angle. Mm. And I think that gift um, uh, to, to our time has just been, uh, wow, so honoring and so precious to us that, and there's a whole litany uh, of those authors um, that are, you know, just Google um, womanist theology and, and you'll, you'll get them all. But yeah, like we, we went to seminary and we didn't, uh, we didn't even get introduced to one of them, not one, right? Uh, which I think is telling of our, of our you know, how we're preparing um, individuals for leadership in the church. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I think by the time I went to seminary, um, I feel like I was introduced to some of the names of different womanist scholars or kind of the general idea of this is what womanist theology is. But were we assigned to read their work? Yeah. Very rarely, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. And right. the the ways that different people read scripture differently depending on their social location is is mm-hmm. huge, right? Like the things that people see in the text, the things that people don't notice, especially when we're coming from a privileged place. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really huge. And and I think it gives me um, it, it encouraged me to to look at uh, expanding theology you know, like, what would that look like uh, from from where I sit or where Heather, Heather and I are trying to 
um, to stem from. And, and I think one of the things that, that I want to hear you talk about a little bit too is <clears throat> the space of the Trinity. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned it in the book, but talk to us about how, how we navigate, how we navigate that. The space of the Trinity in terms of, of gender. Well, um, you, you quote Julian, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm assuming okay. that's Julian of Norwich, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how, and how she, uh, saw the Trinity, right? Yeah. And, and how that message and ministered to her. Yeah. But also if, if we're just looking at a male God, a male spirit, and a male Jesus, then the Trinity, the, the place that we're starting from, where, where these these entities are uh, combined or overlapping or touching each other, it, it's hard to see ourselves as women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the the way that Julian of Norwich, um, who was a medieval mystic writing about the 14th century, um, the way that she talks about the Trinity is really cool and really interesting. Um, she kind of blends and mixes genders together when it comes to God. So she'll say, you know, like, Christ is our father and our mother. Um, she'll she'll uh, talk about the Trinity in terms of our our father, mother, and spirit, or um, different kinds of of mixing, um, which I think is is really helpful for those of us who have been raised or spent time in context when it's like it's only father, son, and spirit, and that's the only way you can talk about it. Um, I think it's really helpful to realize that theologians for many centuries have thought of it in a more expansive way and have used this idea of three in one as this very expansive thing that God can be masculine and feminine and neither and both all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I think, yeah, just that like that fluidity um, that a lot of theologians would use to talk about God and gender. um, not just Julian, but others as well, like male theologians who you might never expect to talk about God and the feminine are writing all sorts of things about God as our mother or Christ as our mother, um, Christ breastfeeding us as a mother would, um, just very beautiful kind of expansive imagery to talk about God that you might never yes. expect. Yeah. You have a thought about that, Heather? Always. Or a question? <laughs> um, I, yes. I think that one of the things that is so beautiful about expanding it to include the feminine in the pronouns, but not just in the pronouns, but in that idea of mother is very often we have need of God to come and reparent us because our human parents mm-hmm. have, you know, probably tried, but maybe not, <laughs> but they have failed us. And they failed our the vision of who we are needing them to be and, and what we need them to be. And allowing God to be father, mother, allowing God to be he, her, it, it allows us to receive that nurture and that care in ways that by demanding a masculine, uh, it, it leaves us not only short-sighted, but it leaves us with a place of wounding as opposed to healing. And so for me, the invitation to have God remother us and have God refather us and have God rebrother us and sister us and family us is really a beautiful invitation into wholeness in our own life and into the permission to say, I may have needed a new vision of what a, a mother is or what a father is or what a brother is or what a sister is because perhaps the poison <laughs> got deeper into family relationships. And I w- to just talk about a moment ago when you were talking about the poison that we've taken and hopefully an antidote, I think when we've received it as a poison and received an antidote, we cannot be quiet about the fact that it's poisoning others. Like we can't watch someone mm-hmm. drink it and then go, well, I hope that works out for you. It made me really sick. You know, We would, we would do right. something like probably extreme and say, oh, don't put that in your mouth. You know, like th- that, that's going to lead to something that is not only uncomfortable, but could be death, you know? And so we would share, this is where I found help. This is what happened when I stopped drinking that. <laughs> and and be able to say, I think very often that's why in the imagery in scripture, it's this water that comes 
from another source. You know, it is always this purification. It is this clean water. And I think that probably since humans have been telling the story, we've been telling it, you know, in a way that is misguided. I just see that in Jesus's invitation to us. Um, You've heard it said, but I say unto you, Jesus expands it. And then even, you know, in in Acts when, you know, in many different circumstances, but, you know, the Spirit is expanding to Peter and what it's like to belong, what it's like, you know, who's included and who's out. And so I see that New Testament imagery. I appreciate very much um, you're reminding us about Julian of Norwich, but all of these other mystics and these women who, who bring us weekly to the communion table, to the Eucharist and go, when it's offered to us, this is my body broken for you. This is my body. Bro-. I, I think that it, you'd be hard pressed to find someone other than a woman who could really say that, <laughs> you know, this Mary who allowed her body to be broken for the Christ to be born gets to say, this is what it looks like when we're saying this is how love is sustained. So mm-hmm. I'm always excited about the idea that allowing different language can not only resonate with us, but can bring healing to us in places that we have kind of locked away. Mm, Yeah. And I like how you talked about kind of God as mother and kind of reparenting us. Um, Because I think, I mean, I'm I'm very hesitant to say anything like, you know, fathers are like this and mothers are like this, um, because everybody's so different. And all these, the attributes that we might associate with femininity do not apply to all women. And that's good, right? Um, But I do think that we all have these experiences um, of, of what we hoped for or experienced in a mother and what we hoped for or experienced in a father. And we all have these imaginations of kind of what love looks like in these different forms, either what it did look like for us or what we wanted it to look like. Um, so I think it's really it's really powerful to imagine God in both of those roles, not because there should be gender roles, but because that's been kind of how our imagination has been shaped. And we're missing something if we don't picture God as, as both, right? Um, yeah. How do we move away from that binary uh, mindset? How, how do we? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think. I mean, I think, that's ex- that's expansion in itself, right? Yeah, right. And I think queer thinkers have been and continue to be really helpful for me in thinking about that, right? I feel like I always have to kind of check these binary notions mm-hmm. that are deeply ingrained that I don't want to have, but are still there. Um, but the way that a lot of queer people have experienced and, and trans people have experienced kind of the the gender just in a very different kind of non-binary way than I've experienced it, um, I think has been really helpful and really liberating, right? Like to to realize that these are these categories that we have in our heads, but they don't actually match who people are or who people should be. Um, Cause I think right. that's, that's free, not just for queer folks, but also for straight women like me who don't necessarily fit into all of the feminine descriptions. Right. Um, Yeah. And kind of realizing that we all embody these different characteristics and that's good. Right. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful, what a beautiful image you just gave us. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump back to your book real quick. Unless you got something. I I have a million things, you know that, but no, head back to the book. Okay. Um, so, so in this expansionist, uh, section of your book, um, you talk about, I want to, I want my theology to expand. And one of the questions that I have is, um, do we have to extract the masculine completely? Um, and if so, for a while or how long, how long does it take for us to come back around and embrace that? If there's people that are listening to this that just says, you know, I'm with Liz, I cannot read one more male author or listen to one more male preacher. Like, I remember being in that phase too, right? That space. And I knew it wasn't, it was a season, it wasn't going to be forever, but I could not go to church if there wasn't a female pastor on staff. Mm-hmm. I just could not. I couldn't bring it to myself. And 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 so the question is, um, for those that are going to read your book— and for those that will listen to this podcast about your book, um, do we have to extract it for a while? 
I think that's a great question. And I feel like it's really personal, the sense that it's different for everybody. Um, So I feel like I want women to be attuned with what our needs are. And if we're in that space where we can't go to a church that doesn't have a female pastor, that's okay, you know? Um, But it's also okay not to be in that space. Um, So I think, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a matter of figuring out like, what what do I need? Like what is feeding me spiritually right now? What is draining me and just not healthy for me? Um, And making movements towards spaces that are healthy and life-giving, not because they're perfect. Mm -hmm. um, But I think Mm -hmm. there should be some sort of basic sense of like, this is more life-giving than draining. I'm finding something here that's fruitful for me in some way. Um, And you also mentioned like, you know, what is the place of kind of taking a break from kind of male influences or, or maybe even male kind of descriptions or pronouns for God. And um, I mean, I think the, the ultimate goal is to reimagine completely what both femininity and masculinity look like and mean. Um, Mm. So for masculinity, I mean, there are ways that we might construct masculinity that are healthy and good, but that's really different, really different from how our culture generally constructs masculinity, right? So there might be um, ways of constructing masculinity that help us move forward, um, that help us move away from the violence and domination and aggression that's often kind of associated with masculinity. Um, So those are, there's like this kind of toxic aspect of it that we don't Mm -hmm. want and that we don't want to associate with God. Um, Mm -hmm. But there might be kind of a healthier version of it that we can move toward. And I'm thinking that male authors are an important part of kind of thinking through like, what does that healthy masculinity look like? There's, there's quite a few people that are in this, Well, I hear more and more, it seems, more than maybe five years ago, Um, this deconstruction space and reconstructing and finding ways to to keep their faith and expand their theology in a way that they're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. And I, it's one of my hopes, and I I think Heather's too, is, is that people return to love. Right, mm-hmm. that they return to this place where they are, to use Heather's word, beloved, uh, that she has so wonderfully graced to us all, and helping us to to see ourselves that way. And so, it if getting people through nice churchy patriarchy is the goal of your book, what are some of the best ways? that we can do that? And how can we tell others, you know, read this, and and this is this is where Liz is going to take you? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, oh, yeah. I think that's an interesting image of moving through nice churchy patriarchy. I don't know if I quite thought about it in that way. Um, but I think my hope is to help people who've had some experiences in patriarchal church environments to process those more fully, Um, to fully acknowledge the things that were very wrong, because we're often told that it's not wrong or told that if it is wrong, it's not that big a deal. And we should just kind of Uh go with it. It's fine. Um, It's not fine, right? There are many things that happen Mm. in churches that are not fine. Um, So I think my hope is to help people who've experienced that really name it and acknowledge it, because that's part of the journey of healing um, and figuring out how to move forward in a different way. So yeah, the first half of the book is a lot of like naming um, some of those experiences and dynamics and sorting out what is so wrong about them. And then the second half of the book is more about how do we move forward differently for those who have found some value in the Christian faith in particular um, and don't want to throw it away entirely. How do we mm-hmm. how do we do things differently? Um, so that involves you know looking at scripture differently, looking at theology differently, looking at church services differently, looking at leadership differently. So many different things. Um, so my yes. hope is that it feels hopeful in the sense of like for those who don't want to throw this out entirely, like there is a different way to do it. There are different mm-hmm. ways to do it. Um, and different ways to think about things and a lot of people who want to do things differently. So I hope it feels like it's kind of a, um, not really like a roadmap specifically, because I think it looks so different in different contexts, but at least like some things to think about 
um, on that journey. Heather, any any closing thoughts or ideas before we tell people how they can connect with um, Liz? Um, I think that I want to be really clear that if you allow love to guide you, if love is the anchor, that you do not have to be afraid about stretching, about growing, about expanding. I know mm-hmm. sometimes because we haven't been taught to question, because a lot of times we haven't been taught to look past what um, we can see now, that it feels a little bit uncomfortable. And, and so all of us would say permission to expand your thoughts or to think differently, but that sometimes the actual practicality of that is very uncomfortable in our bodies. And so right. remembering that if you have an anchor like love, if you're gonna, if this is gonna cause greater love for yourself, for God, and for others, then think those thoughts, then ask the questions, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. then wrestle with that until it actually, you find the blessing in that. Um, And then I also want to be really clear about the fact that as much as we're saying feminine and I am a woman and love that, we need to be mindful that even the descriptors of the word feminine go beyond what has been given to us in the Christian church. I think sometimes like we have a lot of things that are like somehow elevated or like motherhood for, for one thing in particular, or being um, married is another thing that we've elevated and recognizing that femininity exists in many different places. And that when we're saying, you know, that you should listen to the female voice of God, that you should listen for the voice of the divine feminine, that it goes beyond the traditional roles that have been like deemed appropriate Mm -hmm. by the church, that your singleness is holy and you don't need any other person to tell you, you know, to, to add on to you. And so um, even in our nudge toward, hey, look here for an antidote, <laughs> also look beyond what here might be, like expand your idea of what it might be to be a woman and what that might look mm-hmm. like. And so um, I think we can put a lot of fun things in the show notes and, and you know, because I think we have other books that have been so helpful, but Shelly, you recommended a Google search, but sometimes Google searches are limited. I don't know how often Google will put way up at the top, like we can rank them for you, definitely with the yes. bell hooks. But there's some beautiful other authors that offer such life-giving um, invitations to us to hear spirit, but to live and body in spirit, but to pay attention to how love gives us permission to not only set ourselves free, but to to set others free as well. Thank you, Liz, for writing this book and for um, being a voice <clears throat> in this space to to help us all, right? To really help us all understand um, how we move through these these periods in our life. Yeah, thank you. Where yeah. can people find you? Yeah, um, I'm pretty active on Instagram at Liz Cool J. Um, and recently have been writing on Substack a lot at Growing Into Kinship. So those are a couple of good places. Great. And and where can they get the book? Uh, anywhere books are sold online, pretty much. Bookshop.org, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. All right. We'll put some links in the show notes cool. um, for those places to find you. Thank you, Heather, for, for oh, hosting course. again and uh, making this space available to us. Um, it's been great to to be here today to share with you you both. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It was our joy to have you listen to our conversation today. If you would like further information or for more content, visit us at expansionisttheology.com.